Hi, my name is Harmony Hensley, and I'm excited to talk to you today. I come from two different kind of arenas in the ministry world. My primary role is uh, at Vineyard Cincinnati, where I serve as the pastor and director of outreach and inclusion. So it's my job to get the people in the seats engaged in kingdom work out in the city. And it's also important for me to make sure that we have a systemic approach to including all people in the body of Christ. I also serve as a consultant for Key Ministry, where we get to equip churches and lay volunteers to serve families impacted by hidden disabilities. Today we're going to talk about welcoming ministry environments, and this is a very visual topic. So you're going to want to take a moment to pause this video presentation and follow the directions on the site to download my PowerPoint presentation so that you can see the things I'm referencing. As we get started, I always like to know where we're going on an adventure, so I want to give you guys a quick outline of the points that we'll cover. We're going to talk about how environments shape behavior and what that can mean for you as a ministry leader. We'll also look at experience design and designing our ministry not just from the physical space but the entire space that people will encounter. We'll also look at accessibility to make sure we can get people into the building and space planning and sensory issues. A lot of times this is an area that is often overlooked by churches so there's lots of fun things to explore there. We'll also talk about low budget tips to be able to influence your building to be a much more welcoming environment and we'll look at planning for the future as we know a lot of churches the good news is healthy things grow and as we grow we want to make sure we're planning with these families in mind so let's get started the first thing that we're going to talk about are environments shaping behaviors for instance every day you and i in interact with a number of different environments that are going to control the way that you and i socially interact with everyone around us and the specific space we're in for example, if you were to leave your house today and go buy a movie ticket and go see a movie, when you go into the movie theater, they have designed that space to make sure that you are set up to be successful at enjoying a great production. The lights are down low, there are acoustic uh, pieces in place to make sure that the extra sound from the child crying next to you or the woman who forgot to turn off her cell phone is not disruptive, and everything points to the front of the theater so that your attention is focused. If you go to an amusement park, they want to make sure that you forget what time it is. Look at Disney. They want you to lose track of time and dollars while you're there. So they have a beautiful surrounding that's meant to engage every sense that you have so that you'll get lost in the, in the magic that is Disney. You also look at a classroom where your children go all the time. Those environments are designed for learning to make sure that your child can engage with the material that the teacher is presenting. We want to pay attention to those things and influence our space in the church environment to make sure that children are going to be able to have a meaningful interaction and get to learn a bit about Jesus. What kind of behaviors does your environment enc encourage? Do you have a really loud, noisy environment that's maybe a bit overstimulating when children come in? That can be, unfortunately, a major barrier for some of our kids to even get in the door. Or what about visual clutter? Often we think that if we can make our space look super fun and engaging and we can have pictures everywhere, that that maybe is the best ministry environment, when in reality it can make it even harder for some of our students to focus. The great thing is all of the tools we're going to talk about not only help influence the child with the disability, but also empower the typical children to have an even more meaningful experience. Let's talk about setting the table. When you and I have guests over to our house, we want to make sure that we've prepared for them. We want to make sure that our hospitality is up to the level that is going to impress and wow them that they'll want to come back. The same thing is true on Sunday mornings when we open our doors to greet people to tell them the good news about Jesus. So what we often talk about is what would show the extravagant love of God to the people that we're going to be serving. We want to talk about what would show the extravagant love of God to the guest. Who is the guest? For the instance of this particular program, we're going to talk about a child with a hidden disability. What would be welcoming to them? That's when we look at things that uh, interact with sensory issues in terms of sound, color, acoustics, all that good stuff. What about the parent? What will have the parent feeling loved and respected? What will set them up to have a successful uh, adventure here with us at the church from the parking lot all the way to the pew? What about the family? Unfortunately, a lot of us who have served in inclusion ministry for many years have heard story after story of families who disability comes onto the family story, and in the beginning, the extended family rallies, and they're very supportive, but unfortunately, as time goes on and the child gets older, we see that a lot of the extended families take a giant step backwards. This is a great opportunity for us to model to them what the kingdom of God looks like, that we rally, and that we do life together through the good and the bad times. What about the volunteer? We want to make sure that the volunteer feels fully equipped to be engaged in this ministry. Unfortunately, the number one thing that usually presents people presents an obstacle for people serving individuals with disabilities is that there is a fear of the unknown. So how do we dispel that? How do we talk about the elephant in the room and educate them so that they feel empowered to be able to have meaningful relationships and successful encounters with these families? 
What about the community? We realize that we are a light to our entire community. There are people who will never grace our campus. They will never come through our doors, but they will certainly hear stories of those who have, of those who maybe interacted with a church where they really came around their family and got them engaged and connected in meaningful ways. And you know what? They might show up at the pediatrician's office looking a bit more rested. And the doctor's gonna notice and ask mom, what's going on? The family seems to be doing really well. And she can then tell the tremendous story about how your church has rallied around her. What about the vendor? We do live in a country where market, the marketplace is a very important piece to consider. And every good businessman or businesswoman wants to make sure that their business is helping their community to be a better place. So invite them into the story. If there are ways that their goods or services could help enhance your ministry, give them a space to do so. As you look at all of those different things, you're gonna come up with a very comprehensive way to approach ministry. A great example of that is a communication key that we'll look at later. That was something that we came up with uh, in a brainstorming process to help equip a volunteer, but ended up loving all the other parties we just talked about because it equipped other people to feel engaged in the ministry, valued the parents, and made the child feel comfortable with the environment they're in. But we'll talk more about that in a bit. One of the biggest things is getting in the door, literally. There are some folks that we will serve that unfortunately your physical building itself is a barrier. In the early 80s, there was a piece of legislation passed called the Americans with Disabilities Act. Most people are very familiar that this exists, but are very intimidated about what it could mean for your church. If you have old construction from before the legislation passed, you have been grandfathered in. However, if you do any kind of renovation or new construction, your church has to legally meet those requirements. Obviously, you would end up getting an architect involved, but keep in mind this is an evangelism opportunity. Not every architect knows Jesus yet, so this is an incredible way for you to use your ministry to expand to yet another person who's going to interact with you. Invite them in and ask for their expertise, and as you go through that process, be intentional about building relationships with them and letting them know that the good news of Jesus is not only important for these families that you're serving and getting through the door, but it's important for them as well. We also want to look at things like transportation. A lot of these families have a lot of trouble getting to and from where they want to go, particularly if they have a child impacted by a physical disability. So look at your campus through that lens. How are your curb cuts? How many uh, accessible parking spots do you have? And what proximity are they to your children's ministry? Is your parking team equipped to help folks get in and out of their vehicle to make that an easy transition? Unfortunately, I've heard of countless stories of families who have made it all the way to the parking lot only to be so overwhelmed by the process of just getting in the building that they pack up and go back home. What a miss for all of us who are waiting inside the doors, greeting them. So make sure that's something that you think about. You can also invite individuals who are impacted by disability to help you assess that. One of the things that I love to have team members do is to get perspective. It's always good to have a fresh lens when we go through our ministry and try and see it through the eyes of the people that we wish to serve. So one of the things we've done are what we call wheelchair field trips, where we will have an individual on our serving team sit in a wheelchair and we will go through our entire campus from that vantage point. Can you see the signage? Would it be easy for you if the hallways were crowded to tell where you needed to go? How wide are the hallways? Is there a really tight turning radius? Some of the newer, more high-tech wheelchairs have a very high turning radius because of the motor on the back of it. Is your church accessible for them to be able to get through with great ease? If not, are there ways that you can staff that to help them direct through the, through the crowded areas? Do you have automated door openers? This might seem really silly, but how frustrating and intimidating to get all the way to an area. Perhaps you're a fifth grade boy excited to go into the children's ministry and you don't have the ability to open the door. You've gained so much independence by this point and now you're very, very frustrated. If we don't have the automated doors, that's okay, let's staff it with a hospitality individual or perhaps even better, a peer from their age group to open the door and get them in. Do you have elevators? Elevator access is very important and often comes into play in older buildings where there's been an addition and they'll add an elevator to be able to get people to and from the second stories. Is it clearly marked where those elevators are? Are the elevators in good use? We um, have worked with a certain church that unfortunately their elevator always gets stuck. How intimidating for our guests who know that the elevator has a reputation for getting stuck. Make sure that they've been serviced regularly so that they're going to be well prepared to get our folks where they need to be. Also look at um, your parking lot as the front door. Unfortunately, we start to think about things when people get to our physical door, but literally the moment that they turn off of their main road into your space, they are in your church. Make sure that you have it staffed in a friendly way, or maybe there is some signage to help direct families that this is the, the easier interest to get into for children's ministry. I know at the Vineyard, when you come in, we actually have a dead end off of a main street, and it could be very intimidating, and all that congestion with 7,000 people trying to come to church on Sunday to not know where to go to get into the children's ministry. So we have great signage out there that lets them know that if they go to the right, they're going to get there much quicker and be far less frustrated, and their kids won't be frazzled either. So look at your parking lot as well. 
Also, in terms of your hallways, unfortunately, older buildings typically have the more narrow hallways, and newer construction has wide, expansive spaces. The slide you'll look at from the download, you can see a beautiful example of very wide, open, welcoming space. Keep in mind, this is a double-edged sword. Sometimes wide open spaces can cause anxiety for some of the kids we serve. So just be very mindful of that in the way that you staff it from a human resources standpoint as well. Also consider exterior signage. As I mentioned, sometimes this all, all of our best pla laid plans go folding together in the parking lot, which is the most crushing thing I can think of. We know at the Vineyard that we have an odd layout in our building, unfortunately, and really a family who has an individual in, in an elevator needs to park by our south lobby. So we've made sure that we've denoted that very clearly in the parking lot so that they feel honored and respected when they come in. How embarrassing to go in a door and not even be able to get through the building when that could have been prevented from the curb. Also, we want to talk about planning for kids with hidden disabilities. Now, this is a disability that is not outwardly apparent. For instance, if you took a picture of this child, you wouldn't be able to tell by looking at the photograph that this child maybe had some needs that, that needed to be addressed. Unfortunately, in the church, we are un sometimes blissfully unaware that we serve hundreds of these kids in our midst, and we could make the church experience a much more positive one for them. Some of the things we like to look at are going through your own senses. Let's look at visual stuff. Look at lighting. Uh, there's a huge, huge need for us to address lighting, and it's one of the easiest things to fix. Unfortunately, because of cost, usually there's a lot of fluorescent lighting used in churches, and that's okay. I understand from a stewardship point of view exactly where you're coming from, but there are ways to make fluorescent lighting more friendly by using light filters or dampers that are easily accessed online. We'll talk about a website later where you can look at those, literally for as little as $20. Those lights also tend to make a noise that can be very, very frustrating to individuals who have sensory processing disorders. So be mindful of that. Color. We love bright colors in the church. We want to make sure that this is a fun place where the kids want to come back. But unfortunately, in color usage, we don't realize that we can help depict behaviors in a pretty significant way. I once served with a church they had painted their entire children's ministry area big bird yellow. It was bright like the sun and it had squiggly arrows that were bright blue and all kinds of primary colors. It looked like a crayon had just exploded through the space. They were very excited about this space and wanted to show it off, but they couldn't understand why all the kids would come in and would be bouncing off the walls all the time. You see, before they'd even spoken a word or had any of their programming enacted, the colors had set the tone that this was a space to go crazy. They did a simple paint job and used jeweled tones, which are a little bit more neutral, still vibrant, but a little more toned down, and they were amazed at the dramatic difference that they had in terms of behaviors for their students, and it was as simple as a $20 gallon of paint. Also look at limiting your color palette. More is not always better. Pick a few choice colors and consider using them to even be able to help denote where a child would want to go. For instance, maybe the burnt orange hallway is for preschoolers and the teal hallway is for elementary age kids. That can help to clearly identify spaces and make for a less confusing exchange for parents when they go to drop off their children. Also look at visual clutter. As I mentioned before, I've been to many a uh, classroom that is filled with every craft project that we've done for the last six months and posters of every story that, that we t have ever told from Noah to Moses to Jesus to Zacchaeus, they're all on the walls. And then we have children come in and we want them to focus very specifically perhaps on the story of Adam and Eve, but they can't focus because they're still fixated on the picture of Jonah and they want to know why we're not talking about Jonah. There are smart ways to use the visual space that we have to focus the attention of all the children we serve to reinforce the curriculum that we have. Consider using plotter images that reinforce the theme that you're on for six to eight weeks so that everything in the environment is helping the teacher to be more successful and the student to better engage with the gospel message that you're presenting. Communicate with pictures. A lot of the children we serve think in pictures. This is called visual cognition. If you want a great demonstration of that, I strongly recommend having you and your volunteers watch the movie about Temple Grandin's life. Temple Grandin did a great job advising the Hollywood producers on how to best depict that, and it's a great way to get your volunteers to start thinking differently about how the children we serve interact with their space. Also consider getting professionals involved such as speech therapists or special educators who might be sitting in the seat sipping coffee and have never been invited into the adventure that is ministry. They would love to use their talents to be able to further the kingdom and not just the education system. And they've got tons of amazing resources and tools that they can use to help enhance your program. This is a great example of utilizing pictures in terms of your signage so that the signage is not only effective for students who read, but also for students who think in terms of pictures. This is from a partner church that we've worked with. The sign simply says we use our hands to pray to Father God, and there's a great picture of a little girl praying. 
This communicates to all the children that we would potentially interact with and further reinforces the message. And that's a wonderful thing. This is a great example of an open check-in area with neutral tones and plotter images to reduce the visual clutter. The great thing with the plotter images is that they're typically very low cost and can be easily produced and can really, really reinforce the visual stuff that we're already talking about in the classroom. So if we're doing a whole segment on Jesus and the cross or the Easter story, have your plotter images be based on that. Simply roll them up, store them in a PVC pipe and take them out next year when we talk about Easter again. Very quickly, you will come up with a huge amount of resources to use in the, in the months and weeks going forward. This is an example of the communication key I referenced earlier. When we were brainstorming some of our initial respite outreaches, all of the people who were on our leadership team had zero experience working with children with disabilities, which I personally love because it's a great testament that you don't have to have a professional background to serve these families, just a heart to serve them. Communication key is simply made by board maker images that have been put together and are then attached to the volunteer name tag. This allows the child that we're serving to be able to self-guide and self-direct themselves to what they want to do next and also helps the, the volunteer to feel like they can really communicate with the children we're serving. This helps the parents to feel like we've done our homework and know how their child thinks. So this is a very honoring way to make sure that we've taken into account a lot of sensory issues that these children might be facing. We also want to look at sound. Sound can be very painful for some of the kids that we serve, and acoustics are often easily, to treat, easily treated by window treatments such as panels, curtains, blinds, even some sort of embroidered bulkhead at the top that maybe you put some sort of logo on. There are a lot of options there. And then we want to look at the flooring. Now I understand most children's pastors cringe at the thought of carpet because you see visions of grape juice and jelly and peanut butter and Play-Doh ground into the carpet fibers, and I hear you on that. However, now we have new technology and products such as carpet tiles where you can put carpet tiles down, it'll look like a full room of wall-to-wall -wall carpet, but if a stain should happen, you can pop up one tile literally with a screwdriver and replace it easily or wash it and return it. This way there's a great uh, level of sound that is absorbed by the floor itself and creates a more comfortable seating environment. Some of the children we serve have anxiety about what if I have to sit in an uncomfortable chair or what if I sit on the floor and it's cold or it's hard or I don't like it. This is one more way to make the environment welcoming but also taking into account stewardship and understanding that we want to make sure it's a clean space for the children we serve as well. If you do have tile or hard surface spaces, often a lot of local carpet companies have remnants that they would sell to you for a specific bargain discount and you can have them bound and place them maybe in an area in the room that's strategic to story time or group time and then the children can understand that part of their routine is that they go and sit on the carpet square when they're going to hear their story about the Bible. That can be a great tool for them as well. In terms of touch, not everyone likes to be touched. And I know often when I visit a church, I see well-meaning hospitality volunteers who greet the students at the door with a big hug and a warm embrace. That embrace doesn't feel warm or welcoming to everyone we serve, so ask first before engaging in a hug and make sure that you've trained your hospitality staff accordingly. Unfortunately, that one simple gesture that's well-meaning and well-intentioned can often be catastrophic for some of the kids that we serve. Make sure you have comfortable seating options. I know one time I was working with a young man who happened to have autism and we would have floor time for stories and he did not like to sit on the floor. It just really upset him, but he loved his beanbag chair. So we kept a beanbag chair in the corner and simply pulled it up and he was able to sit there and that way he could still engage with the rest of his peers and hear about the story, but also could be comfortable and able to focus more effectively. We also want to consider having things such as fidget toys. These are great for some of the children that we serve, but not all of them. The Therapy Shop at www.therapyshop.com is a great place to get these kinds of resources, including light filters. But make sure that you talk to a friend who maybe is a special educator or in the therapy world who can tell you who these tools would be helpful for and whom they might be distracting for. But either way, have them in your cupboard or your bag of tricks to make sure that you're set up to be successful for any child who comes in. You also want to look at make sure, making sure we're good stewards. I understand every ministry leader is looking how to stretch a dollar and that we are living in a recession and so that unfortunately causes for even tighter budgets in churches and nonprofits all across the country. I'm with you. So here are some great low budget tips to start to enact change in your space as your budget allows. Paint is often the very first thing I will recommend people to get. This is as cheap as $20 a gallon, and often if you go to local paint stores, they have what we call oops paints, and if you can mix those paints to create the color you want, sometimes they'll give them to you free of charge or deeply discounted, so always ask about that, and usually they'll take you to a back stock that's got all kinds of options for you. 
Classroom light filters are one that I mentioned earlier that can be a great way to make harsh fluorescent lights much more welcoming to the kids we serve. And a lot of them are very fun. Some of them look like clouds or maybe have different shapes on them. These can be purchased at therapyshop.com and other online options and usually are as inexpensive as $20 for maybe a set of three or four. So always look at those. Window treatments. Everyone's been to the clearance bin at Walmart or Ikea or Target. A couple of curtains can go a long way in terms of acoustics, so make sure your windows are treated appropriately. But do take caution because some blinds can have long strings that can become a safety hazard. If that's the case, make sure that they are mounted up higher so that children can't get a hold of them and have any, any trouble with them. Plotter images are great to reduce visual clutter. If your church doesn't own a plotter, perhaps there's another church in town that would let you use their plotter at a reduced cost, or you could garner some sort of discount with a local store such as Kinko's or FedEx. Also consider beanbag chairs and oversized pillows. These are always very easy to buy in the fall as they're a hot item for dorms all over the country. So consider asking people that as they prepare their child for college, maybe they buy an extra beanbag and donate it to your ministry. Beanbag chairs are awesome and always gonna be useful in the, kit in the environment. Sensory bins. Beans, beads, and bubbles are some of the favorite things that I've ever seen kids interact with and they cost nearly nothing. Have some Rubbermaid bins with a good mix of things that kids can just rake their hands through. This can be such a fun tool and really costs nothing. So if you've got a bag of beans or beads laying around or some bubbles from a wedding that was last summer, bring them on in and let your children's ministry use it. Clocks. Don't forget the clocks. I've seen many a meltdown averted because we were able to hand a child a clock and they could see that when the big hand got to the six, they knew mom or dad were coming back or that when the big hand got to the seven, we were gonna to transition to story time. A lot of the kids we serve are very sensitive to schedule and time and so honoring them by giving them the power to see the clock and see where time is going will be a huge, huge tool for you to have in your tool belt. Also consider having visual schedules. Visual schedules are great because they help the child know what to expect next. They're also really helpful for the volunteer who's maybe a little nervous about what's gonna happen and can be a great tool even for the typical kids to be able to help everyone know what to expect and what happens next. It's just a few pictures you can print out. If you don't have access to board maker software, simply use clip art and laminate it and put it on the wall and you're ready to go. Now, we also have talked about healthy things grow. We all hope and pray that God will bless our ministry and that it will grow and that we will bring more and more people into the kingdom. This is a win. But as that happens, we wanna make sure when we expand that we plan and think about people with disabilities in terms of the new space that we have. Always remember that if you build it, they will come. Like the old movie said, you wanna make sure that you've created a space that's welcoming for the folks that we're wishing to serve so that if they do come to your campus, they have a positive interaction and want to come back. Make sure that you prepare families for any transition that may come into bear. I once served at a church that had gone through a multi-million dollar addition and they were going to be changing dramatically the children's ministry space. There was a lot of excitement for most of the families we served, but for the children who we served through our special needs team, there was a lot of anxiety about this new change. They were very comfortable going to their classrooms and we could tell that as the weeks got closer to the opening of the new space and excitement mounted for everyone else, fear was heightened for the families we served. At the time, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory was out in the movie theaters, and so what we did was we had a golden ticket gala where all of the kids who we served through our inclusion ministry were sent a golden ticket in the mail, just like in the movie, and they got to come to a very special VIP sneak peek party after church one Sunday where we had pizza for lunch and then their buddies and some of the folks from our children's ministry stayed after and we actually got them hard hats and they were able to walk through the new space where it was completely quiet, there was no one else there, they could get comfortable and start to get used to where they would go and could walk through what their new routine would be. This simple pizza party was a huge benefit to us as we transitioned into the new space. And that Sunday when it came time for us to open the new classrooms, we had very little incident with the families we served as they felt really supported and engaged in the process of moving into this new part of our ministry. Also look at social stories to help with these transitions. Social stories are a great visual way of depicting what is going to happen next. We use them in a lot of our respite ministry. We have a one page downloadable uh, social story that parents can print out and show their child so that they can prepare for what's gonna happen once they get to the church. If you know you have a major change coming, create a social story that depicts that and give it to the families far in advance so that they can have time to go over it and the child can get very com comfortable with the changes that are coming. Partner with parents for this plan. Working with parents and kids to design your new space and prepare for transition is one of the smartest things that you can do. They know their children the best and they know what their experience has been at the church and they can help you bridge that gap of 
not knowing what to expect so that it can be a pleasant experience for the children and they feel empowered and engaged and included in the process as the body of Christ expands. And that's a win for all of us. You also want to create a wish list for future ministry supporters. There are some folks who maybe because of time constraints can't necessarily serve with your program, but they might have resources. So create a list of things such as bubbles, beans, beads, bean bags, things that start with B, um, that would be a blessing to the folks that you serve and let them know that that is a way that they can engage your ministry. Clorox cleaning wipes can be a blessing just as much as their time on Sunday if that's the only way that they can engage. Also, if you're going to have new construction, you're going to want to look at different options in terms of inclusion ministry. There are trends where we have self-contained classrooms and sensory rooms so that some of our kids who would not be successful in the typical ministry environment have a great place for them to go to be included in the body of Christ. Consult with your architect to see ways that you can include that in your space. Also look at accessibility. As we mentioned before, it's very important for folks to be able to get into the building, but accessibility doesn't stop at your front door. It goes throughout your entire facility. So make sure that that area is very family friendly for folks to interact with. Look at proximity to exits. This can be a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it's great for our uh, ministry areas to be close to the entrance and exit so that the families can quickly get into where they need to be uh, without having to have the anxiety of crowded hallways. But it also means that there's a flight risk for some of our kids who like to be runners. So just make sure that you staff it wisely with hospitality volunteers to keep your kids safe. Also look at acoustics and lighting. As I mentioned before, there are a number of things that you can work with your architect or designer to make sure that you've got the best options available for your kids. Also consider a pod design. Some of the churches that I've toured have got a great uh, layout that is considered to be a pod where there is a main room where all of the big time story and worship happens and then it empties into smaller classrooms for the group time and then has um, no access uh, readily available to the kids so that that way uh, they're not running through the hallways and you're not running in laps. So consider a pod design. Most architects can walk you through what some of those examples are. Always make sure that we're thinking in terms of universal design. Most people have heard of universal design in terms of home building for those who maybe are going to be aging in their home and want to make sure that as they go uh, from being in their mid-30s to their mid-80s, the house is still going to be a good fit for them. The same happens in the life of the church. We want to make sure that we have universal design so that everyone, regardless of ability, can freely interact with the entire campus with no problem. And make sure that you've given space for there to be room to grow. Again, healthy things grow and we want this ministry to get bigger, so make sure that you've not blocked it into a part of the building that it can never be expanded. Always consider a space for an extra bump out for bigger rooms or more facilities for the families we serve. Consider creating space for therapy equipment such as a sensory swing, but with that I give a word of caution. Be very careful about how much therapy equipment you have in your church because we want to make sure we send the right message. The church is here to spread the gospel. We are not a therapeutic environment. However, there are some therapeutic tools that can make a better environment for the kids we serve, such as a swing. So just be smart about balancing that. These can be pretty big ticket items, so also talk to the families you serve, as often their children might have grown out of a piece of therapy equipment and it's just sitting in their basement and could be a blessing in your facility. So make sure you talk to them as well. In terms of renovating, we often take time to renovate, remodel, and renew our space to try and get a fresh look on what we have to create a fun environment for the people we serve. Room selection and usability is very important. I worked with one church that was very excited because their inclusion ministry had grown. They had a self-contained classroom and that classroom was no longer large enough. They found a larger room in the church, but unfortunately it was the old choir room and there were two doors that opened onto the main stage. So needless to say, a couple of the kids from the inclusion ministry have made a cameo appearance on Sunday morning because they got through the door quickly. Make sure you think about those kinds of things when you get a new space. Sometimes we get so excited about the bigger space, we don't think through whether it's really a better fit for our ministry. Look at fabrics and finishes and make sure that we're considering acoustics and setting everyone up to be successful. And consider updating your signage. Unfortunately, sometimes we get so excited when we move into the new area of the church, we forget to really denote for people how to get there. We don't want them to continue to go to the old spot and be completely lost or uninformed on how to get to where the ministry now is placed. And again, make sure that there's room to grow. So even in the new space, you want to make sure that it, as it continues to grow, there's more place for it to morph. Because God will bless this ministry as you follow his heart for these families. That's pretty much it and probably seems like an overwhelming amount of things to tackle, but I would recommend just pick one thing. Maybe it's a gallon of paint. Maybe it's a carpet square. 
maybe it's a walkthrough where we're taking our volunteers through in a wheelchair to just to get perspective, but just do one thing. And as you continue to do one more thing, before you know it, you'll have an incredible ministry environment that's conducive for all people in the body of Christ to engage with the gospel. And that's where we see real life change. If you ever have any other questions or need more advice on how to make a more welcoming ministry environment, please feel free to contact us at Key Ministry, and we would love to help you brainstorm ways to make your space a perfect fit for the families you're reaching.